Somebody once asked me, they said, what would it take to get you to leave Christianity? And I said, eh, it's easy enough. Um, don't. Convince me that God doesn't exist. Okay, I think that leaving Christianity would be a logical you know, response to that belief. But then I thought, so that's pretty tough. I said, let's lower the bar. Let's lower the bar. Let's make this a little more interesting. You want to get me to leave Christianity? I want you to convince me of a fact that's supposedly as certain and as indubitable as, quote, the earth going around the sun, close quote. And that is Richard, I'm quoting Richard Dawkins. And he's saying the fact that is indubitable, that is as certain as the earth going around the sun is Darwinian evolution or what they call today the neo-Darwinian synthesis because they move beyond Darwin and basically it's simple life starting out billions of years ago then being able to genetically replicate itself and then going on and then ultimately evolving through natural selection and on and on through the different stages so you got the various Neanderthal man and then Homo erectus and then Homo sapien and you know the whole the whole spiel I said you convince me if that's true convince me that's true and then I'm out of here I'm out of here I would put Christianity on the trash heap and I'd be gone in a minute. I wouldn't have anything to do with anything with the Bible. I'd either be, I'd become an atheist. I don't think that's a God who created that way is a God I'd particularly want to worship. I mean, how could you do anything else other than abandon Christianity if you believed evolution were true? Think about it for a minute. If Darwin were even close to getting origins right, our origins right, God might as well have told us that the stork brought babies as to inspire Genesis 1 and 2. If the creation of life on earth of humans took four billion years or whatever they're saying as opposed to six day, off by a factor of about, I try to do the math, 182 billion, 500 million to one. Why should we trust him on anything he says? A fortune cookie taken out from a Chinese restaurant would give us better odds of getting things right than what the Word of God would tell us if evolution were true. I mean, let's get, let's get hypothetical for a moment. And let's pretend, just hypothetically, that the Genesis creation account was never to be taken literally. And that, let's pretend that evolution were in fact true. Let's suppose that God was communicating with us about the work of creation. And let's suppose that the texts in Genesis weren't to be understood literally, or some would say literalistically, but metaphorically, symbolically. Okay, let's go on that assumption. Let's say they were meant that way and nothing more. You know, and that he really did use evolution to create life on earth. Then given that premise, what was the creator seeking to teach us about our origin? Well, I want to just look at a few verses from Genesis first, from Genesis 1. Let me just read these to you. And as I read them, think about what they're saying here. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God said, let earth bring forth grass, 
the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and God said let us make man in our image after our, our likeness so God created man in his own image now whatever else you could take from there again even reading it broadly reading reading it in a very general way everything was planned everything was precise everything was calculated there's nothing random there's nothing arbitrary there's nothing chancy here at all it would take a very strange interpretation of Genesis 1 to derive any kind of randomness out of it everything is precisely created in its time and in its place there's nothing at all in the text that hint at any kind of randomness at all second let's look at some of these verses again Genesis 1 and God created great whales and li every living creature that moves which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after their kind and God said let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creeps creeps upon the earth after his kind notice this emphasis over and over distinctly emphasized again and again and again each creature was made after its own kind after its own kind clearly distinctly differently one beats one creatures one way one is another way even these texts reveal unambiguously each was made after own, its own kind that is each was made separately and distinctly from the others so even from a non-literalist reading of Genesis a non-literalist reading of it a broad reading there just seem to be two points two points that just jump out from the text from the text number one you know that nothing was random nothing was random in the act of creation and there was no common ancestry from the species there wasn't one beginning species and then everything branched out separately from that okay two things from again a very general non-literal reading non-literalistic reading of Genesis nothing left a chance everything made after its own kind and then along comes Darwin Darwinian evolution in its various incantations and even the most broadest reading of evolution all any different kind of evolution at its most basic fundamental level Darwinian evolution teaches two things they're basic they're fundamental to it it's not evolution without it and that is randomness and a common ancestry for all species Can you see the point here how then does one interpret Genesis through a theory that at its most basic level contradicts Genesis at its most basic level okay we're dealing with fundamentals here totally contradictory then if evolution were true it would mean that for thousands of years from the whole Israelite period up through the New Testament church 
up to the Protestant Reformation and beyond, the Lord kept his church in darkness regarding human origins until God, in his infinite wisdom, raised up his divinely appointed one, Charles Darwin, an atheist or at best an agnostic, to finally reveal the truth to us about the proper interpretation of Genesis. And though we shouldn't judge somebody in the 19th century by our standards today, God's man Darwin held some extremely racist views. My goodness, have you ever read some of the stuff he wrote in The Descent of Man? Okay, even worth, thanks to Darwin, in his theory of human descent, racism now had been given a scientific rationale because there was a scientific reason behind it. Some species, some people were more highly evolved than others. Finally, too, many of Darwin's teachings, his basic teachings are rejected by evolutionists today. That's why they call it the Neo-Darwinian synthesis because they move beyond that. Even Richard Dawkins, who's kind of the Muhammad Atta of, evolution, of evolutionary apologists, once wrote, quote, much of what Darwin said is in detail wrong. So, where are we? If evolution is true, then the Lord used an agnostic with racist, with racist tendencies with detailed errors in his teachings as the divinely appointed one to finally set the church straight on Genesis and our origins after thousands of years of us being left in abject darkness, being totally wrong about how we came here. And now there's more. Let me read you a quote from Darwin because contrary to popular views, Charles Darwin did not work, you know, he wasn't working from a this purely objective viewpoint. We talked in a class earlier, I don't think the concept of objectivity, is, it, it, it's a nonsensical concept. Pure objectivity for fallen human beings, it's a, it's a nonsensical concept. Yeah, but I'm not going get, to get off onto that epistemological quagmire right now. But Darwin worked from a theological premise. Darwin had theology that helped influence his theory. Let me read you. There seems to me, wrote Darwin, too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designed, designedly created then he used a fancy term I just put in here, the parasitic wasp with the express intention of feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that the cat should play with mice. Okay, so he was working from his concept of what he thought God should be like. I mean, that is a theological statement. And of course, we know that a beneficent and omniscient God did none of those things. Thus, ignorant of the great controversy and the consequences of the fall, Darwin began from a fatally wrong premise about the creation he, he sought to explain. Here's Darwin again. But I had gradually come by this time to see the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarians. Now this was God's appointed vehicle? This was God's man to finally reveal the truth to humanity about its origins? Now. There's nothing absolutely contradictory about the Lord using someone like this to teach the world the truth about the origins. I mean, it's not logically impossible. But it does raise the question, 
when using Charles Darwin supposedly to pull back the veil on our ignorance about our origins, why did the Lord raise up about the same time that Charles Darwin was doing his thing, why did he raise up a prophetess, Ellen White, only to keep her wrapped under the very veil of darkness and, in, and, and ignorance that he was using Charles Darwin to pull away and to finally reveal to us the truth. See the point? Right about the time of Darwin, there was the same time of Ellen White. And Ellen White had a completely different understanding. So it doesn't make sense. Did God raise up Darwin and Ellen White? I mean, even... I don't want to get in a whole thing about Ellen White. Even if one ejects the every word of Ellen White as verbally inspired terminal truth, shouldn't the woman who helped found a church with the message about creation and the Sabbath and with a message that worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountain of waters. Should she have been clued in, in one way or another, by the Lord, about the startling new light uncovered by his man, Charles Darwin, about creation? I mean, couldn't he kind of tapped her on the shoulders and said, hey, honey, well, I would say, say, hey, honey, excuse me, but say, hey, Ellen, chill out. Chill out a little bit. Okay, you know, where uh, it's don't be so fervent about it. And yet, listen to what she said all through. I mean, he couldn't he have lightly tapped her on the shoulder and told her to cool it in her vehement opposition to the very truths that he had waited thousands of years and was now finally unveiling to the world through his appointed vehicle, Charles Darwin? See a conflict here. Let me just read you. All through her ministry, Ellen White was uncompromisingly, uncompromisingly anti-evolution, as dogmatic and anti it as, as I have been and continue to be. It is, she wrote, the worst kind of infidelity. For with many who profess to believe the record of creation, it is infidelity in disguise. Okay, that's pretty strong. And I happen to agree with her. Deep down, you really believe in evolution, you... Well, anyway. She goes on. Evolution and its kindred errors are taught in schools of every grade, from the kindergarten to college. Thus, the study of science, which should impart a knowledge of God, is so mingled with speculations of the theories of men that it tends to infidelity. There's that word she's using again and again, infidelity. Shall we, for the privilege of tracing our descent from germs and mollusks and apes, consent to cast away the statement of the holy writ, of holy writ, so grand in its simplicity, quote, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Education, the book Education. And then in Testimonies to Ministers, when the Lord declared that he made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, he means the day of 24 hours, which he marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. And there's more. So how in the world do you possibly reconcile God raising up her and God raising up Charles Darwin at the same time. They're hard to, you can't reconcile. Either she's wrong, and, or either she's totally wrong and Darwin's right, or she's totally right and Darwin's totally wrong. There's no middle ground here. And there's more. People say, well, you know, the ancients, the ancients couldn't understand something like evolution. You know, it was too difficult for them. So the Lord had to frame it in a way for these ignorant primitives to understand. And finally, it wasn't until the 19th century that we were able to handle it, this. That mankind was finally able to grasp this. 
Well, see, that's patently false. Okay, concepts similar to evolution were known all through the ancient world. A friend of mine at the GC, Dr. Angel Rodriguez, had been doing, I'm still doing his research, showing back in ancient Egypt and then Sumeria, way back, pre-Israelite times, there were these concepts of, of human beings you know, evolving and animals, you know, evolving and people and humans coming out of them and so on and so forth. God didn't have to dumb it down for the ancients. I mean, have you ever read too, you read in, um, this is much later, um, the Roman writer Lucretius, writing a hundred years, I can't remember a hundred years before Christ or after Christ. I mean, this is later. My God, his Dererum Naturum. It's all atheistic evolution. It's pure evolution. This is a guy writing about a century around the time of Christ. And by the way, for whatever it's worth, if you want to read what I consider absolutely the best uh, attack on the concept of the immortality of the soul, read Lucretius de Rerum Natura, because I think it's the best attack on the immortality of the soul I've ever read anywhere. But anyway, that's not the point, though. The point is, in the ancient world, in, <coughs> in the ancient world, these concepts were known. God didn't have to dumb it down for them. The Lord could have revealed the truth to them and us instead of promoting a fairy tale, one that hardly parallels the model anyway. Because again, if you read it, billions of years of false starts, chance events, and endless death allegorized, allegorized as a six-day pre-planned pre creation with nothing left to chance and no death. If evolution is true and God inspired the Bible, then Genesis becomes satire. And God, I wouldn't trust God's word on anything. Plus two, the seventh day Sabbath as a memorial of a six day creation that really didn't take six days. It took billions and billions of years. I mean, come on, we might, again, we might as well pay homage to the stork and believe that the stork created us or brought babies than to believe the evolutionary model. And here's a point too, whatever it's worth, who believing that we creation required these billions of years instead of six days will actually risk persecution or death standing for the seventh day Sabbath as opposed to the mark of the beast. Something to think about. But even worse, even worse, think about what evolution does to the whole plan of salvation. Just think about the implication. The Lord incarnates into an evolved ape. You know, basically, Richard Dawkins says, Human beings, we are African apes, period. That's how he describes us. We are African apes. That is the human being. So the Lord evolves, the Lord incarnates into an evolved African ape created through the vicious and painfully murder, murderous cycle of natural selection all in order to abolish death, the last enemy, as Paul says in Corinthians, but how can death be the enemy when death itself was one of God's chosen means for creating humans to begin with? Can you see the point there? In evolution, death is a crucial and necessity and necessary component in the whole survival of the fittest model. The Lord must have expended plenty of dead Homo erectus, Homo heber, I don't care, Heidelbergerness, and Homo neanderthalus, all in order to finally get one in his own image, Homo sapiens. 
So the point is Jesus comes to save mankind from the very process God used to create it in the first place? I mean, does that seem as silly to you as it does to me? Then there's the altruism problem, one that troubles even atheistic evolutionists, much less those who toss a loving God into the mix. I mean, I have more respect for atheistic evolutionists than I do for theistic evolutionists, particularly theistic evolutionists who claim to believe in the Bible. I can respect atheist evolutionists, though I think they're wrong. I have zero respect for theistic evolutions, those who profess to believe in Christianity and evolution. Sorry, that's just, you know, whatever. Anyway, in this vicious doggy dog process of natural selection, in which the strong overpower the weak, if these were the means by which we came into existence, then why should we do anything differently? Are we not following God and the dictates of nature as He ordained it when we advance our own interest at the expense of the less naturally selected? Those who are not quite as selected as we are? In an evolutionary paradigm, we should eliminate the weak, making, ways, making way for those who are already closer to the so-called image of God, the process by which all this pain and suffering death was supposedly to lead us to. One theologian, and I'm ashamed to say he's even an Adventist, he argued that, well, animals really don't feel pain. Okay, that was one mind-bogglingly brilliant attempt to get God off the hook for all the suffering that the process of evolution entails. Homo erectus didn't become homo sapien by following the golden rule. So why in the world should we? Now, of course, evolutionists have come up with all sorts of speculative theories about altruism and how it could have evolved, though it does seem kind of strange for God to use a process of violence, and the strong crushing the weak and so forth, all in order to evolve beings who are supposed to love their enemies and give their lives for others. I don't know, it just seems kind of strange to me. As I said, it just atheistic evolution makes much more sense than does theistic evolution, particularly a theistic evolution that's supposedly based on the God of the Bible. And then there's the fall, the fall of mankind. Now, how does this work again? How is this supposed to work? God uses a process of violence, selfishness, and dominance of the strong against the weak in order to create a morally flawless and selfless being who falls into a state of violent selfishness and dominance of the strong over the weak, a state from which he has to be redeemed or else face final punishment. We commit sin when we do the very things that God ordained we do in order to exist. Of course, that just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? In the plus two, in the evolutionary paradigm, eschatology becomes very interesting as well. Final events, there are, are you know, new heavens, new earth. Let's think about this for a minute. We got God's promise, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah 66, 22. For as a new heavens and new earth which I shall make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. 2 Peter 3:13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 
Now, will that new heavens and new earth be created by divine fiat? God speaks and it is something similar to what happened in Genesis, at least what a fair reading of Genesis would teach, what the church has believed about Genesis from the very beginning, or when God creates this new heaven and a new earth and his beings in there, or will life again endure the rigor and joys of natural selection and survival of the fittest for billions of years into a new world, one wherein dwelleth righteousness finally appears. If God used billions of years to create the world the first time, with the vicious and violent process of evolution as the means to create life on earth, if he did it that way the first time, why not do it that way the second time? Or if he could do it by divine fiat instantly or in six days the first time, then why doesn't he just, the way he do it the first time, why doesn't he do it the same way the second time and spare us all the joys of evolution? Can you see the absurdity of trying to meld these two? Be an Adventist, be an evolutionist, but end the farce. And the farce of thinking you could somehow be both. But people say it's science. It's science. But science teaches us. Oh, don't get me off on that. They say evolution is proved by science. Well, you know, the answer for me, that is so very, very simple. The science is wrong. Simple as that. And if you study the history of science, science has been wrong over and over and over and over again. It's been wrong before and it won't be, and, and it's going to be wrong ag again. All through the history of science, oh, I wish I could get off on that. I, I think I, somewhere I got in here, I got a, a, a sermon on that somewhere on just the, the, this idea in the 20th century, well, science teaches it, and therefore it's got to be true. See, I can remember, too. I remember, I was raised. I was raised on evolution. Bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Never, I was never taught it in a way it was really, it was taught with the kind of certainty in which you teach that the earth circles around the sun, okay? I mean, it was pretty much, you just were taught that way. I can still remember in the fifth grade, in the fifth grade, a textbook. And actually, these were the textbooks that came out in the 1960s that later on first started the whole creation evolution battle in America. And I can still remember in the fifth grade, they'd start with a photograph of like a, of, 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 of a primitive pool. And then there'd be a single-celled creature. And then there'd be like, like an amoeba, then a jellyfish. And then some kind of amphibious creature. And then, so, you know, a, a, a dog or, I don't know, a dog or something. And then you know, some kind of primitive ape and then a human being and then they draw a line through it and that was it. That was it. You were never taught to question it. I can remember in the ninth grade in Nautilus Junior High, same junior high that Doug Batchelor went to at the same time he was there too, which was kind of funny. We only found that out a few years ago. Doug Basher and I were in the same junior high in Miami Beach at the same time. I didn't know him then. I just said, Doug, I didn't recognize you. You wore your hair differently back then. <laughs> but I can remember in the ninth grade, the teacher teaching us, this, all, this is all fancy, fancy sounding stuff, teaching us what's called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Okay, now that's a big mouthful, but all it teaches is this idea that if you look at an embryo, 
that if you look at an embryo, you can see the stages of human evolution in an embryo. Supposedly, there are gills on the side, and that was when we were in the water, originally fish and so on. And now the thing about this, this was proven a hoax. It was started by some, some uh, a, a, a German evolutionist in the, in, the, in the early 1910s or whatever, who promulgated this, made these drawings to make these fetus, whatever, frogs look like they were going through it. And within a few years, it was shown it was a hoax. It was, no, it was exposed as a hoax 70, 80 years ago. And then yet in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, I was being taught that in a science classroom in the United States, something that is known to have been a farce for decades. I can remember, oh, you know, 10 years ago, my, my father's wife, trying to use that argument on me. Trying to, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. This has been, this has been de debunked for, dec for a long time. And people are still using it. Still using it. And for, anyway, the thing that happened to me, I was born and raised on it. I never questioned it. I was never taught to question it. Then one day, I woke up, I was a born-again believer in Jesus. And I'm sorry, it didn't take me very long to suddenly realize, you know, there's a contradiction here, okay? There's, I mean, I don't know why, you know, it was even before I knew anything, before I knew the word I'm using all the time here. If you haven't known the word, you'll know it by the time I'm done. Before I knew squat about much any of this, I could see a blatant contradiction between my new belief in God and my experience with God and what I had been taught dogmatically, unquestionably my whole life, and that was Darwinian evolution. And I remember what happened, though, was some people gave me early on, because I was wrestling with this, and some people gave me early on, they gave me a couple of creationist books. And I have no idea whether those books are any good. As much as I hate to say it, some of the creationist literature out there is pretty pathetic. It's pretty bad, unfortunately. But, and I have no idea whether those books were good or not. But that wasn't the point. What the profound impact that they made on me and to this day, it's very important, is that I was given these books, and for the first time in my life, I was shown that there is another way to interpret the evidence. Can you see the point? No one's denying the dinosaur bone in the ground. Okay, you know, you hear this stuff, creation, some creationists say, well, Satan created the bones in the ground to test our faith and all that. I, you know, it's nonsense. No one's denying the bones. I take my I raise my kids at the Smithsonian. You know how many times we've gone down and seen the, the, the skeletons of the, of the, um, the dinosaurs in the, um, the museum? But those dinosaurs don't come written, created 800 million years ago in the Pleistocene era, you know, or created in the, you know, the African savanna, you know, 20 million years ago or something. No, it has to be interpreted. And that's, it's, it, you almost need, for a, a word that the theologians hear, you need a hermeneutics. Because to a certain degree, science, and really in many ways, is just a form of hermeneutics. It's a form of interpretation. And for the first time, even though, again, I had no idea if the science in those books were any good or not, in these creationist books, all I know is suddenly, for the first time, I, I was given a new an understanding that there's a whole new way to interpret it. 
And the more that I've read in creationist literature, better stuff, the more I've come to realize just how flimsy, how flimsy and how weak and how speculative so much of what is pawned off as absolute fact on evolution really is. You know, I, Darwin, I, I read enough of Darwin to know Darwin had reservations all the time about his theory. You know, he believed it, he promoted it, but he wrestled with it. And I am, and again, I'm just speculating, but I tend to believe that if Charles Darwin had any idea, you know, Darwin lived in the day and age when they still talked about the simple cell. Nobody, nobody talks about a simple cell anymore. My goodness, the cell wall, just the wall, the membrane around a cell is so filled with mystery, so filled with, with complicated, detailed stuff that there, you know, just goes on and on and on, that I really doubt, and again, I'm speculating, I really wonder if Darwin had he had any idea that, if he went to taken one look in that and said, nah, this can't work. But unfortunately, there was a whole lot of both political, social, and you know the sad thing about it is, when Darwin first came out with his stuff, some of his most vociferous critics were other scientists, other paleontologists, and so on. The people that started promoting it at first, the most, were, believe it or not, clergymen. Clergymen were the first ones. And then eventually, that generation of scientists that opposed them died off and a whole new generation came up and we've been living with the specter of evolution ever since and unfortunately and unbelievably I don't know if it's a problem here but we've got to deal with it in some of our Adventist educational institutions and I'm sorry you believe in evolution you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist. You might think you are. You might think you are. But you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I just don't understand just the lack of moral integrity of somebody who believes in evolution and would actually work for the denomination and take a paycheck or even promote it. It's just unbelievable. Not only is it unbelievable to me that we have that, it's unbelievable to me that it seems in certain quarters to be tolerated. It's unbelievable to me. If you, you might as well have people teaching voodoo as being Adventist and teaching evolution. You know, we don't, as that, we have no choice, at least in my thinking. If evolution is true, our religion is false. I just don't, you know, I'm sorry. If evolution is true, Adventism, the Bible, is a joke. It's a lie. There's no middle ground on this. How do you meld, you know, either we, God created us in six days or billions of years? And I've, and I've even challenged some Adventist evolutionists. I call them Seventh-day Darwinians. And they're very offended by that. Well, too bad about you. I did it purposely to offend them. I said, all right. If you don't want to take a literal interpretation of Genesis, fine. Show me, give me some kind of model based on your science that you worship that you think, well, this is science, this is what the science teaches. Show me some way to harmonize. Give me some model of evolution that you can harmonize in some halfway intelligent way that can allow me to still in believe in Genesis. You see what I'm saying? 
saying, show me some way that you could somehow harmonize them. Show me some model that makes sense. And oh, I battled them on some of the, the, the blogs on the internet, and it's just pure nonsense. It's pure nonsense. There's no middle ground. That's why I said to the person. Now, at the same time, I want to make it clear. You know, I, it's funny, wherever I go, I wrote this article. I wrote this article in 19, in 2003 called Seventh Day Darwinians. And I just thought, what's the big deal? I just, I thought I was making a very simple, obvious point. If you believe in evolution, you know, there can't be an Adventist. Well, it just shows you how sick there are certain elements, aspects in Adventism that me writing what I thought was obvious would cause, had caused a furor. It caused a furor, and the furor still hasn't died down over me stating what I thought was blatantly obvious. That, you know, if you believe in evolution, I basically said, don't you think the, uh, the honest thing to do would be to join another church? Seriously. If you believe, there are plenty of churches out there that don't take Genesis literally, that don't believe in the seventh-day Sabbath, that, you know, go on and on. There's so many of them out there, it's amazing. Go join one of them. I mean, don't you think you ought at least have the moral integrity to believe the name that you take for yourself? Seventh-day Adventist implies what? Six days of creation. At least have the moral integrity to believe the name you have for yourself. Well, anyway, that article came out, and then anywhere I go, I was just in Australia a while back and was eating dinner at a church official's house, and his son just laid into me. You're advocating kicking out the church, anybody who believes in evolution. And I said, oh, really? I said, you show me where I've ever said that. I've never advocated kicking anyone out. What I've said is, I don't understand why anybody who believes in evolution would want to be an Adventist. And I have no qualm in saying, if you believe in evolution, you really don't belong here. Well, that's been twisted, and any, everywhere I go, I even have friends come back to me and tell me, Cliff, you know, you go places, and they say, Goldstein's saying to throw anybody out who believes in evolution. So what I read, I just finished it a couple, about a week, I finished it before I came over here. I wrote an article called A Safe Place. And in it, I pretty much give my little spiel here, how ultimately, if you believe in evolution, you don't, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You can dupe yourself into thinking you are, but you're not an Adventist. And if you truly believe in evolution, you don't belong here. At the same time, I said, though, I understand, I understand the challenge that science presents. I understand the way science is taught and the challenge that it presents. So I said, if somebody is struggling, and I emphasize this, if anybody is struggling with this, we need to make sure that the church is a safe place for them. It's a, we've got to be able to work with them, help them work through the issues, not condemn them, not judge them, not demand that they leave, and on and on and on. I mean, we need to work with those who are struggling, particularly those who are going into secular schools where any hint of teleology, any whiff of creation or purpose is, you know, is, maniac, is, is maniacally attacked and not only do they believe it, they don't allow anyone in the students to even give you a whiff of that. I understand how science at the time that it's being taught could seem so overwhelmingly clear. I mean, so overwhelmingly, I mean, but, but there are scientific theories that a generation ago were considered foundational that have been completely overturned. Completely overturned. I mean, get me off on physics. 
Some of the most basic things in physics that were just assumed absolutely certain, they're on the trash heap of history. So I understand those things. So I say for people who are struggling, our church needs to be a safe place for them. At the same time, if somebody is convinced that evolution is true, then you don't belong in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I could say to someone, we love you, we care about you, but don't you think simple honesty and integrity would lead you to go somewhere else? And I remember somebody said to me, well, what would you say to someone who thinks they could harmonize their evolution with Adventism? And I said, well, what would you say to someone who you believed held views that were totally contradictory to the most... What would you say to someone who says, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, but I don't believe in God? What would you say to someone, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, but I don't believe in the seventh day? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I don't believe in the advent of Jesus. I mean, I could go on and on. I'd say the same thing to them who say they're evolutionists that you might say to somebody like that. So, I guess the bottom line in the end... If you wanted to get me to leave Christianity, if you wanted to get me to leave Adventism in particular Christianity, just prove to me that evolution is true. If it's true, I'm out of here. I don't know how any honest person could do anything else. But meanwhile, I can be mocked, I can be derided, I can be labeled a creationist, a fundamentalist and goes on and on and on. I really don't care. I really don't care. The Word of God is too plain and too clear. Choose the God of Darwin. In fact, one last point. Remember I once went to a very interesting debate, or I heard it on tape. It was at this Willow Creek. You might have heard of Willow Creek for a while. All the Adventists were taken. It was a new Mecca. All these Adventists were going to Willow Creek to learn how to do play church, you know, and uh, finally the leaders at Willow Creek at one point said, now our, our whole paradigm didn't work. They came and admitted it, and I don't think it did Adventism a whole lot of good. I wasn't against it. I just been, you know. I, I heard even Bill Hybels once said, he said, Adventism, what we're doing here isn't going to work for Adventism. And I think it was obvious. But I remember once I heard a debate that was given at Willow Creek between an evolutionist and a creationist. And I mean, it was really a joke. I mean, the, 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 the creationist was a fella named, or no, it was between, an, it was an, an atheist and a theist on the existence of God. Now, the, the theist, some of you might know the name, I mean, he is awesome. His name is William Lane Craig. You've heard the name, some of you, oh my goodness, this guy is just an absolute, one of the greatest minds, I think, Christian thinkers in the 20th century. You know, he's got some, comes out of the reform tradition and all that, but all that aside, but Craig, in fact, I got this great big thick book, Foundations of a, Philosoph of a Philosophical Christian Worldview, that it's going to take me a year to work my way through that thing. Craig was one of the authors. <coughs> Well, he was debating a fella on the existence of God. Well, they brought some poor schnook in from Madeline Murray O'Hare's American Atheist Society. Now, this might not mean anything to most of you, but my goodness, I could have argued the atheist position better than this guy. I mean, really, I mean, it was a joke. It would have been like putting me in a boxing ring with Muhammad Ali or something. Okay, I mean it was. I mean, Craig wiped the floor with this guy. I mean, it was. It was. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Except at one point, and I think William Lane Craig is finally coming around on this now, because I was very disappointed. Because at one point, the whole question of evolution came up, and much to my disappointment. 
William, as I said, I think he's coming around on, on this. William Lane Craig said, well, the jury is still out on evolution. The jury is still out. We can't make, a, you know, any strong point about that yet. And I'll never forget the one point that the atheist said. And I thought he was spot on, right on. Was he responded, he said, evolution is how Satan would create, not God. And I thought, you know, you're right. One point for the atheist. So if William Wayne Craig scored a thousand and the atheist scored one. But on that one point, I think he's right. I would not want to worship a God who created through the evolutionary model. So in the end, choose the God of Darwin. Choose the God of the Bible. But let's not fool ourselves into thinking you can somehow choose and serve both.